Hello, and welcome to another episode of Such a Nightmare, Conversations About Horror. I am delighted to be Catherine Troyer, and I, but I'm even more delighted to be joined by Anthony Tresca. Hey there. This is a podcast where the horrifically nerdy meets the terrifyingly academic, as we explore that fine line between the horrific and the horrible. Each episode looks at specific horror texts that are, for better or worse, giving us nightmares. And we are so excited to have you join us for our episode over 2014's Australian horror film, The Babadook. We originally had talked about doing this as our our 50th episode because we were yes, thinking I, like, what can we do? I, I remember that conversation because we were originally thinking, oh, perhaps we'll do a retrospective look at a, at, at a movie that uh, you had really disliked when yes. it first came out. But I was really confident that I could convince you that this movie was amazing. Like that yes. this was the movie that we needed to be talking about. And I was so confident in fact, that I requested that this episode be the 50th episode because I was that confident. I was like, I, I thought so. And then, and then I distinctly remember you came and you were like, so I watched the film. Yes. No, <laughs> and you were just like, not, not what I want to do for the celebration that is our, our 50th episode. Right. So it's, Spoiler alerts for my own personal reaction to this movie, not not necessarily the movie itself, although as for every episode, obviously massive spoilers for the entire movie to follow. Yeah, spoilers ahead. Well, I rewatched The Babadook. The first time I had seen it was back when it came out. I saw it back in 2014 or so, either 2014 or 2015, right when it first came out. And I was, I loved it. I was like the probably the first horror film that I had ever myself sought out. But then I, upon this rewatch, I've got to say, just did not hold up in the same way that it did when I was a, a very young teenager seeking this film out. And I will say for me, uh, I had a bit of a, the opposite reaction where the first time I watched it and I 100% blame marketing for this because I, mm -hmm. I think marketing should take the blame for many a thing, but the marketing for this film was that it was going to be this like fast paced uh, supernatural thriller with lots of deaths and action and monsters. And of course that's could not be further from, yeah. from the I, truth. The marketing team did a really poor job. It, it seemed from the looks of it, this looked more akin to something like a entry in the paranormal uh, activity franchise yes, rather yes. than what it actually is, which is like a slow burn art house horror film about grief, more akin to something like A24, which also has problems with marketing their films, but it, it is more, it's more like one of those films than what it was advertised as. Absolutely. I was discussing, I was describing this film to someone and they said, oh, so kind of like hereditary in terms of like the, the vibe and, and the spirit of things. And I was like, yeah, that's a pretty good description. So, so really what we have is, is Jennifer Kent giving to us much before I think we were there as a, as a larger movement, this much more, like you said, art housey feeling uh, horror film. So the marketing meant that I went into it the first time expecting things that did not happen. So I was very disappointed because it is slow burn is probably um, a, a generous uh, statement to be making about it. It's just a very, like, you feel like you are in molasses, which makes sense because we are, we are identifying with Amelia, right? We are caught in this state of depression that is exhausting, but that is definitely not a paranormal activity or like insidious type film. Which again is kind of how it was marketed. It was how it was marketed. And what you said is perfect for encapsulating this feeling of grief that the that Amelia is overwhelmingly experiencing in the film and it is all encompassing and it feels like it will never stop. 
However, those are not usually words you want to apply to a movie, to an entertain like an experience like that, which I think is ultimately the kind of like thing that frustrated me most about on this on this second watch was that I felt that the themes that were present in the film and its exploration were incredibly interesting and worth worthy of all of the merit that had come to it. However, it was an absolute chore to watch. And it was just not, it was just not entertaining, uh, which is a sad, which is a sad thing to say about a film that I had once really enjoyed. Yeah, it reminded me a little bit of of how you and I articulated our thoughts about watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the 1970s version, because there was a similar, although I would, I would choose Texas Chainsaw yes. as a rewatch uh, any day, but, but there's that same, like, you should not be watching this film as your like go-to comfort film. That doesn't mean <laughs> that you can't watch this film many times. That doesn't mean that you can't think that this is the best film ever, but like there is something viscerally painful about this film that is, is. is literal because there's the screaming and the, and the sounds and just like the agony in terms of some of the diegetic decisions as well as figuratively, because you're just like, please, this needs to end. And again, in that respect, this is an incredibly successful film because yeah. I don't think anyone can walk away and not have gained that subjective point of view, which is a very hard thing to put into film. In, in literature, it's easier because you can have first person narration and you can hear what they're thinking. In film, oftentimes more problematic filmmakers or, or filmmakers that don't know how to, to quite solve this problem will just have mm -hmm. like a voiceover narration. But Kent was like, no, I can make you feel 100% what my character is feeling. It's just that I'm not sure I wanted to feel that way for even two hours, let alone, you know, the like seven or eight years of, of that child's life. And, and interestingly enough, issues of, of categorization do come up in, in the scholarship mm -hmm. on, on this film. So I want yeah, to I, reference- I found that super fascinating when you were, I, I hadn't thought about giving that any thought until you had mentioned this bit of scholarship off before we started recording. Yes. So the there are two different works of scholarship that I want to reference. One of them is going to be on what I think is, is the more obvious of, of choices for scholarship, and that's on the mother and the abject. But the other one, like you said, I, I also hadn't really thought about this. So I apologize ahead of time for no doubt slaughtering this last name, but the <laughs> author is Jessica Balanzetegi. And the article, which is coming out of studies in Australasian cinema is called The Babadook and the Haunted Space Between High and Low Genres in the Australian Horror Tradition. And so Balanzetegi is, is coming out of the University of Melbourne and says that if you look at Australian horror, it's very polarized. There's either stuff that's kind of considered to be like the Australian Gothic which is going to be like Picnic at Hanging Rock and some of these uh -huh. high art films that the people can snootily be like, ah, oh, yes, I have seen this. And, and, you know, it's, yes, I guess you could say that it's horror, but really it's more, right, that sort of discussion. God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, 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 the, it's the films it's that you say you've seen so that you can brag at the parties that apparently, I go to really weird parties if that's <laughs> the type of stuff that we talk about. But it is. Yeah. Right? Like, that's I, I was like... going to say, it's interesting to hear that uh, it basically sounds like the Australians are having the uh, exact same conversation about horror that Americans are having in that 100%. divide between the two type, the two camps of, of horror that have really developed that the high art horror that you just got done. And then this low art, which, yes, which is exploitation. called exploitation, yes, which I love. I love. Oh my God. A new chance to work in an academic pun is oh. uh, is good by me. So 100%. good scholarship. And and I know that, and this is more specifically New Zealand cinema, but we also have something that we've talked about in our uh, Black Sheep episode where it's yep. sometimes called Kiwi Splatter. And, and that's going to be, again primarily our, our New Zealand films, but, but that's another phrase that just delights me to the bottom of my soul. But <laughs> Balan Zedeki is is arguing that we have the the high art and then we have the ausploitation, which her example is like Wolf Creek 2, right? Not even Wolf Creek 1, but Wolf Creek 2. And, and there's this dichotomy that's being built. And her argument is, is that then the Babadook came and it couldn't easily fit into either of those categories because on the one hand, it has some of the elements that we associate with more, um, quote, definitely quote, 
lowbrow horror. It's got some of the jump scares. Uh, it has a more traditional monster form, but it also is employing a lot of these uh, Australian Gothic elements because it's really paying attention to tone and to atmosphere and, and Kent's decisions in terms of the script, in terms of directing is, is really marvelous in places. So the argument is, is that this film people didn't know how to how to market it, right? And they didn't know how to, to situate it because they were trying to cram it into a model that actually doesn't, isn't conducive to talking about Australian horror. So I thought that was interesting to think about the fact that maybe some of the marketing problem is because Australian cinema doesn't know where it wants to fit within the Hollywood schema. It doesn't want to be Hollywood, but at the same time, it knows that if it's the more Hollywood it is, the more likely it'll be successful internationally. Right. And, and so there's just a lot of, of sort of ways in which this film is showing us some of the tensions that, like you said, are not just unique to Australian horror, but really are unique to, I mean, not unique, it's just present in all horror uh, yeah. to varying degrees. It's just a classic, the like high art versus low art debate but contextualized for the modern era. And in that case, specific to the Australian climate, which is super fascinating to think about, like many elements of this film are. Yes. So the other scholarship that I, I want to uh, talk about, which is also coming out of that same journal, the studies mm -hmm. in Australasian cinema, but this is time it's by an, a scholar named Shelley Berger, who is also out of Melbourne, but at a different university, has an article that's called The Beak That Grips Maternal Indifference, Ambivalence, and the Abject in the Babadook. And we've talked about some of these themes before, some of these elements before in this particular podcast, mm -hmm. particularly regarding the abject. But I like some of the things that, that Berger is, is arguing about the film. Or one of the questions she says we need to ask ourselves about this film is what is it that audiences find so terrifying? And then she says, the answer this article will argue lies in the particular nature of not what, but who is made monstrous within the narrative, the figure of the mother. Mm -hmm. The ways that she brings in Kristeva and she brings in the object is that Kristeva and Creed, both, both of people that we've talked about before in our scholarship sections, one of the big elements of the object, that which is us, but not us, the, the mother-child relationship is a perfect way to, to think about abjection. And it often becomes a side of conflict as the mother resists the child's attempts to break away. And so this is from Kristeva. The child can serve its mother as token of her own authentication. There is, however, hardly any reason for her to serve as go-between for it to become autonomous and authentic in its turn. Mm -hmm. Repelling, rejecting, repelling itself, rejecting itself. This is the, the cycle of, of the mother-child. And for Berger, one of the things that she says makes us feel very pronounced and heavy is the removal of a third party. So oftentimes in a family unit, we're going to have a third party. Um, in this case, the, the narrative suggests it would be a father, mm -hmm. but even the, the, the aunt, right, even some of these other people, there's no one to sort of interrupt or intrude the sometimes uncomfortably intimate moments, right, where he's right. like flopping on her lap or sleeping in her bed. Um, and of course, the, they really make us feel uncomfortable because she's in the middle of masturbating, masturbating. right? Masturbating, yeah. Such an uncomfortable scene. Uh, but also, like, that's just, that is a part of being an adult, particularly if you are not with a partner. Um, but it also is super gross and icky. So there's oh, yeah. ways to, in which this film is asking us to think about this mother figure as something that is, like, profoundly disturbing, and, and the fact that the conclusion has this rather ambivalence, is she actually better? Because now she's just feeding the monster, but she's like making it part of her daily schedule. Does that somehow make it better or worse? I think, again, reinforces Berger's argument that maternal indifference and the abject are really what is terrifying about this this film, which should go back to the marketing issue, right? They made it sound like the Babadook was going to be the big, the big danger, but really the yeah. Babadook is is just what it's called because that's Kent's like word for um, postpartum depression and uh, like guilt, anxiety, right? Like that's just her manifestation of this real world thing. Yeah, yeah, I that is a super duper fascinating article and I think speaks to a lot of the elements that and really pinpoints a lot of the stuff that really works about this film is that 
it is all of the stuff in that domestic setting between the mother and the child. Their relationship has some really terrifying and tense tense moments in it that vibrator scene and the and then him sleeping in the bed is perhaps one of the most horrific and terrifying things that i have yes. ever witnessed and yes this was true when i was watching it as a teenager and trying to um and trying to keep this my parents from seeing that i was watching this <laughs> so that scene was also terrifying <laughs> for me because yes. i kept being afraid that my family was going to walk in the same way that the child walked in on uh, his mother. Yes, because this uh, is pre Game of Thrones nowadays. Everyone's just like, eh, I'm, oh. you're going to probably walk in <laughs> on a sex scene. Right. But like this, this is definitely still in that like, I okay, so can't have anyone see it. So yeah. Bad. Because I was the like, scene makes you feel dirty. Oh, yeah. You're not supposed to. It's such an it's the intrusion of such an intimate moment. You feel disgusting as a voyeur for yes. intruding on this. And then when you are, the scene is literally interrupted by, an, by another voyeur and you are still left voyeuring on this now even worse situation that has been yes. created. I mean, the result he, is truly just some really deeply interesting horror that arises from that human moment. Technically, yes. there's not a lot that should be scary about that moment. It's a lot of the social pressures and the fear that comes from particularly that scene, the relationship between the mother and the son uh, that makes, and the context that makes it so uniquely terrifying. And I would argue that, that this is an instance that illustrates that as much as I can't stomach the idea of watching this film again, because I don't think I have it in me to like have the, the mental equivalent of nails on the chalkboard for two hours, this, this film is doing so many amazing things in terms of not just the narrative, but cinematography. So that yes. scene has, has a close up that's bordering on an extreme close up. It's not quite, but it's a close up on her face. And it's showing us that, that the line between ecstasy and pain and how we manifest that on our faces is, is not that far apart. And, and this isn't a new subject. This is something that we've been doing since literally some of our medieval and Renaissance art, like the ecstasy right. of St. Teresa is a perfect example of a statue that you're like, is she erotically enjoying this or is she in pain because she's about to be martyred? Maybe it's both. So this isn't a new idea, but that look on her face that we are forced to experience, like you said, that the voyeur aspect is enhanced by the fact that there is nothing else in that frame to see. Yeah. Her sheets are dark. Her the uh, headboard of her bed is dark. There is nothing else that we can focus on, and there is no opportunity to turn away because the the filming of that particular scene lasts a little bit longer than than many scenes that are kind of like a more quick cut, cut like cut, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, and yeah. and it's just incredibly awkward. And then to have us be still located there in terms of where the camera is, but but guided to the bed also reminds us that that one of the, our most vulnerable times is when we're engaged in, in sex or, or sleeping or doing really any of the things we do in bed. And so the narrative makes us uncomfortable and the cinematography really makes us uncomfortable. So like you said, there's nothing that should be disturbing about that scene, but it is, it is haunting and traumatizing for everyone involved, characters, <laughs> uh, audience, everyone. Yeah. And I, I think what I like what's really interesting about that scene is that it could, it had the real potential to just be like a, oh yeah, female sexuality is like icky. And this isn't this gross that we're watching, that we're watching this, but that would, it's to even accuse that scene of being anything like that is so beneath what the themes and the themes that are present and the cinematography and the execution and the acting that is present in that scene and there's a lot of really good moments like that throughout the film. So I think maybe let's just go through and let's talk about some of the good stuff. And then once we have acknowledged the film, what the film does right, and I, I do want to echo what you said, though I don't think I'll ever rewatch this film, I will certainly talk about it and mention it as in conversations because it does do a lot of stuff really right. Or does it... it stuff that we've seen before in an interesting way yes and i i could see myself watching it again only because i could see myself assigning it in the right course yeah but it would it would not be my favorite moment 
of, of watching. Okay, things that, that are working really well. I, I do want to, to talk about some of the elements of mise-en-scene. Mm-hmm. This is a film that you can tell knows it has a limited budget, but rather than, than creating a text or a film that you're like, my gosh, this would be so much better if they'd had just a little bit more money. They really say, what can we do so that with the money we have, we can create this incredibly oppressive, bleak, slightly sterile, but also very familiar environments, Mm -hmm. um, costuming, makeup, things like that. And so the film feels very, very realistic in in its approach at the same time that it feels incredibly stylized because this isn't real, right? This, it's like a waking nightmare in terms of the color choices are, you know, very stark, right? There, there's not a lot of uh, bleeding of colors in between. There's not a lot of soft light. It's, it's just a, a film that, that is filled with shadows, but also just removed of, of color and, and of joy. Save for the beautiful pop-up book with that yes. lovely red cover, the fonts in there are gorgeous. I, I, I could not agree more. The, like the prop master did such a beautiful job with that, as well as these other artists did throughout the yes. rest of it in creating an environment that feels entirely manufactured and it gives us a beautiful look into how Emil is sees the world. This is not a this is not intended to be anything other than a subjective POV of what Amelia is experiencing, which is beautiful way to do it. And on, you are absolutely right. It was a small budget film, only two, for two million dollars, and that budget was actually even a, the reduced budget from what they were originally promised. They actually had to raise thirty thousand dollars themselves wow. on Kickstart in order to finish the construction of the film's sets themselves. And so, because they were like, they were just, they told them they did not have that money anymore. And so they were like, well, we got to construct these sets. And they were able to raise that, that money um, through that platform to get it themselves. But, and I I think it worked out pretty well. um, I think so too. Beautiful looking film. It is. I want to talk about the book a little bit more. So I don't want to be that scholar right I don't want to be that scholar that's like reading more into an element when they were just like red was a pretty color right so we we made our book red so I want to acknowledge that I I can't speak on on the intentions of the the filmmakers just on how it affected me as a viewer not only is is the red in stark contrast to everything else but because she's often holding it on her lap reading Uh it to him, there is a way in which it sort of becomes a a metaphor for the bloodiness that is, you know, like the womb and and motherhood Mm -hmm. and and the fact that this Berger talks about in her article. So after she talks about the abject, she says, engagement with language also represents an important point of intersection for mother and son and talks about the the reading of the book and and the Mm -hmm. quote simplistic language that ends up being really not. But I think it's very important that this book feels organic in a, in a way that few things do in, in this film. And I, I mean, organic more as in of carbon-based material. So it feels like an extension of her, right? It feels like, again, to kind of extend, I think beyond what, where they were intended, but it's almost like the umbilical cord, right? That that's holding mother and son together. And the umbilical cord is gross, like super, super gross. Yeah, sure. Miracle, blah, blah, blah. Just so gross. And, and there's a way in which this film is, is sort of reminding us that that tether, whatever that might be, a book, an umbilical cord, something else entirely between mother and child is something that is, is profoundly discomforting, even if it is quote natural, because like reading to a kid is a kind of natural activity. So I thought that was just an incredible thing to do, to take this one simple prop and, mm-hmm. and imbue it with so many levels of potential interpretation. Yeah. And I also love just the book itself is a, obviously it's a horrifically tra- traumatic book for a child to hear. So yes. uh, poor choice on the mother, but uh, yet. But is it any different than it any the like. The, the big bad wolf story that we read. At the yeah. Start? I, I mean, I suppose 
not it is just perhaps a little more directly violent than that all those scary stories to tell in the dark i know a lot of people that that was their childhood books uh so so yes you're correct that that it is definitely profoundly disturbing and maybe inappropriate for that particular child in particular oh my god yeah but like (laughs) it reminds me of in in uh new nightmare when they're like did you let your son watch this film and she's like everyone's seen it what are you talking about so there's an interesting way in which it's like this intrusion of this nightmare but really he lives in a house of nightmares is this that much worse yeah i mean that's true and i think the book itself is is interesting because it is one of the few places this film is not super dialogue heavy or any or by any means it is not a talky film it does a lot of really interesting show don't tell yes um However, this book, the book is not one of those cases. It's one of the rare moments in, we get, in which we get to hear um, the writer, director, Jennifer Kent, really lay out kind of the theses uh, and like connect all the, the dots and on the big conspiracy map to extend that metaphor. Uh, the sympt- and laying out these symptoms of grief that they're going to have to figure out how to deal with, the not letting you sleep, invading your thoughts, uh, the survivor's guilt, like making you wish you were dead instead of somebody else. I'm not sure, I under, I guess I would understand why it might be necessary to lay it out, but what did you think about just going so directly literal with the themes in this one sequence? Does it Was it effective for you or do you think it was unnecessary? That's a good question. Because I, I couldn't help but think that perhaps by laying it out in such a literal literal manner it didn't it kind of hurt the rest of the film because I already by this it's and they they read the book in the first act so it's pretty early on that I couldn't help but figure out a lot of where it was going immediately and it really removed a lot of this the surprise and the discovery of the Babadook as not being a literal manifestation but an abstract psychological manifestation of their grief and so while I, I, I think it was an interesting device to lay out all of the themes so clearly, I couldn't help but maybe a, a more abstract reading of this book or at least something to blur it just a little bit because it really is. This is a moment in which the film goes incredibly literal. Yes. There's, no su- there's not a lot of subtext here. So we've talked in, in previous episodes about films that we had a problem with the writer and or director creating a sort of grab bag, you choose you way of interpreting the film. And, and what right. I'm hearing is, is that in this case, it's it's the opposite, right? That it's, it's, it's that Kent said, here is how you will interpret it. I will give you a literal manual <laughs> yeah. to deconstruct the scenes. So what I can't tell you is whether or not that would bother me upon a first viewing if I hadn't had marketing issues, right? Uh, right. Because watching it this time around, I didn't have a problem with it or it didn't catch me the way it caught you in in part because I knew where we were going and I wasn't anticipating there being any surprise. So I think it depends on on how, how we're supposed to read the source of horror. But part of what you're, right. you're saying here is that by laying things out in this manner, there's, there's really no room for us to have the same set of stakes as our characters do also, because we're I, not on this yeah. investigation in the same way. Absolutely. And I also think it undermines a lot of the other potential sources of horror that are present in this film. Like this film, I at least for in the first act, I thought it was setting up an interesting educational... A critique because they're they do a lot of interesting stuff in that first act with Samuel being like treated as a problem rather than a human being for the school to kind of solve although again basically kind of after they lay out what the film is actually about that's dismissed there's a lot of interesting sources of horror that come from the social dynamic uh, from Emil and that group of uh, friends and one of them is the family member Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That that, there's a lot of interesting stuff that could have been done there, but ultimately it's really kind of sidelined. And so I thought it focused the film in a way that definitely brought down the stakes, but also minimized the other potential areas that it could have investigated for sources of horror. I think for me, the, 
the reason I have I have less of a problem with the book element than you is that so you're absolutely correct that it makes it very explicit how we're going to interpret the Babadook at the end and how we're going to read sort of everything that happens but there is an interesting way in which if we think about this this thing that the Samuel is for sure having read aloud to him that mm-hmm. Amelia at one point rem- distinctly remembers destroying and then it reappears there is this really interesting way in which we there's like a chicken and egg issue so is the Babadook the way that things manifest because this book helped create that frame or was the Babadook this thing this this maternal indifference you know depression all these things did it like manifest this book uh, in a sort of literal or figurative sense because there is a sort of if anything is supernatural in this text it is the book itself not not necessarily the Babadook but the book itself and so I think there's a, a way in which the book adds an interesting layer not for interpreting where things are going to go and certainly not for uh, enhancing the tension, but for asking us to think about at what point do we see this as just metaphor? And at what point do we see this as more like magic realism? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting lens to put over it because I guess it would then, it is forced to fall into that more magic realism kind of realm because there are things that happen that just legitimately cannot be explained like unless it's all happening in her head unless it's all happening in her head which is entirely possible based on everything we know from what the film tells us and the subjective pov that we are forced to kind of stay with so i think that that is an entire that's entirely possible reading yeah i think the other reason that i am okay with the presence of the book is that it allows for some really beautiful ways of of showing the Babadook and of having yeah. us think about it so there's that that phrase paper tigers uh to refer to something that seems more terrifying than it actually is but here we have the reverse right we have something that seems like it should be innocent because it's just a depiction it's just the, the coat on the wall that happens to look like a person not a real person but really it is it's this very terrifying very real thing and so I thought the book became a, a valuable way to articulate that the the other thing I think that both you and I are in agreement about is is that the acting particularly uh, the oh. actress that plays Amelia okay. I mean top notch just really great work yeah essie davis is her name and she is a really really interesting actress she's an australian actress and yeah she i really really enjoyed her work here she's at least on the same level as tony collette in hereditary in terms of like mother who is on the edge and cannot take a single thing to deal with and then is forced to deal with like about a hundred things all at once. Absolutely. Um, and I, I just to really, particularly her scenes with um, her son, I thought were just, which is a lot of them would be obviously, but, but were really interesting because I just loved how quickly she was able to switch through this kind of Rolodex of emotions. Yes. It reminded me of this improv game called Rolodex where you just call out different emotions on the side and the actors are forced to change instantaneously. This the Samuel, that her son had such a clear power to do that to her from just, he can be the love, you see that love, you feel the love in some scenes and then in some you just feel the absolute hate hatred and and I love the back and forth nature of it like in that playground scene where you starts the love then ignores him completely when someone more interesting comes along who she uh, to, for her to talk to and he's forced to go to such extravagant links to get his mother's attention and then we see her finally come back and be drawn back into it and I, I and then I copy and paste that same uh, response throughout the entire film anytime there's a scene because it's just really good I like it a lot and there are several instances, again, where Kent has has optimized her actors for success through some elements of cinematography. Yeah. I think about that scene where Amelia is reading to Samuel and she's like, are you sure? This is way too scary. I don't think we should read this. And Samuel's like, read it. And then we <laughs> have a jump cut. So normally when we have a cut between scenes, we don't asso- associate either we have something like a fade or um, something that's a 
like George Lucas style, really obvious transition from one shot to the next. Or we have what's known as an invisible cut and it feels invisible to us because it, we're moving from looking at a scene from one angle to looking at a scene from a different angle or a different perspective. A jump cut is when there is a cut between two scenes and we are still looking at the same frame. The camera hasn't really moved. And it's often used to show not only a passage of time, but often just this sort of like sense of, of discombobulation. And we have a jump cut where she's reading and then jump cut and he's curled up in her lap sobbing and she's reading a different book, right? Trying to make him feel better. And that was just such a perfect example of, yeah. of letting the actors have their performance enhanced by some really smart decisions in terms of a cinematography, because we could have had like a cut to the clock and then back to, to them, right? There would have been so many other ways to show that instead, the story didn't the end well. passage of time is all communicated through exactly. the actor's performances. Exactly. And a smart editing choice. And a smart it. editing choice that, that makes us feel dissettled because again, most films don't employ jump cuts and most films that do do it to make us feel dissettled. So there's that, that real intense sensation. So these were all the things you would think, right? If you're listening to this episode, you'd be like, my gosh, how come they never want to ever, ever watch it again? But for me, I already don't want to have children and I don't want to have children for a, a lot of reasons. And this film just made me like, remember, no. Yeah. If, if ever, if ever someone's like on the fence, I feel like this is the film that will guarantee that they will be like, and no to the children because Samuel is not a literal monster. He's just a kid who's been denied proper mother maternal relationships. So of course he's going to scream and lash out, but every time he did so it hurt physically, emotionally, I, spiritually. I could not agree more. I, I think the just single-handedly, the decision that about this film that made it to where this is not a film that I will probably go back and watch again is the decision to have Samuel see the Babadook first and thus mm. force us to spend so much time what, with him and his ex hor these hor our true horrifying experiences he's having. But I also was so just like, I cannot with this kid anymore. I cannot. If I have to listen to him scream again, I'm going to lose my own mind, which is great. Good. That means that it, the film was successful in, in achieving its attempted goals that it clearly set out to do. However, did yes. not make for a fun film for me as an individual to watch. <laughs> no. And the, the thought experiment of like, what is a situation that might cause there to be from the start a mutation or a brokenness to the maternal bond? That thought experiment of the answer is, if on the way to the hospital, you know, the husband is killed, which is very similar to the, to a, another one that's done often, which is that in childbirth, the mother dies. The mother right? dies. You know, I would keep going back to things that we do like, which does, in our, even in this section where things that we don't like, which again, I guess just does speak to the inherent quality of the film itself, yes. even if it was not a particularly entertaining film. Uh, but but I, I thought that was a fun way, a new interpretation of an old, tired, kind of cliche of like, and now the woman is gone because she did her womanly duties. Yes. Well, what if the mother does her duties, but the dad dies and now is not able to take away some of the burden? Watching this, knowing that that's, that's the situation I would experience if I was in that, right? I wouldn't be living with the loss of my wife and childbirth, right? I would be the one that had to like keep on keeping on just made me so tired. It is in many ways. I, I think that that idea, that initial trope is such an interesting one of the loss of the loss of the father in many ways. It is just another version of that distant father motif because I mean, dead is a kind of distance, isn't it? So in, in many ways, it's a lot of the same way things that we see playing out in regular relationships that have the father present because all of the emotional burden of raising the child rearing is placed on women. And so this film is just a more literal example of what happens, but it does have this type of stuff. And Jennifer Kent was quite explicit in interviews she was, that she was like, I don't ever want anyone to think this mother as being just a horrific monster or being a perfect saint though. She just talks about it as the horror of motherhood. The burden of it is you have to 
love, you have to give all of your love and be this perfect thing all of the time. And it's an impossible expectation. And there is almost nothing ever asked of the other partner. And this yes. film shows is just like a I've interesting, interesting enunciation of that idea. And we didn't even have a chance to talk about the the place, the the literal placing of the the father, where the only times that the we experience him or his belongings is in the basement of the house right and there's all sorts of things being articulated there uh, if we treat this house as a haunted house which it is it's haunted maybe not literally by ghosts but certainly by the memory of this this person that like you said is is still an absent father figure even if it's not absent by choice and so having all of that happen down in the basement versus the things that we see happen in the kitchen like when she kills the dog versus right. the things that we see happening in the bedroom we could have had an entire episode that was just looking at how this film uses space and uses the house to to articulate issues of of psychological well-being so i guess you know if we're this far into the episode and this is a longer episode for us and we've had this many good things to say it's really tricky because I can again say with all confidence, I don't have any desire to see this film again, but I also think it's a film that, that needs to be added to discussions about what the power of horror can do. Yeah, certainly a film that is difficult. I, I find myself feeling weird about recommending because I, I, have to, I do have to add the caveat that I did not enjoy watching the film. But I, I can't exactly say that I would not watch the film again or recommend someone to not watch it because there, as, we, as we've discussed and enunciated so many times throughout the episode, Jennifer Kent has brought into light some truly fascinating and horrific topics that often are, if included, just cl like included as cliches, but she instead explores the cliches and looks at the horror that is underneath the stereotypes and of domesticity, of motherhood, of child rearing, of what parenting, good parenting looks like. And for that, that is like an immaculate feat, a true triumph. Uh, and she deserves to be applauded for her work. And I think it, you should go out and at least watch it once. You can make your own assessment from it if you were entertained or not at the end. But at least once, I think. We appreciate you joining us for our discussion of The Babadook. And as always, we would be delighted to hear from you. You can contact us. Our social media information is in all of our descriptions of our various episodes. Let us know what were your thoughts about the film? What did you mm -hmm. agree with in our discussion? What points are you like, no, you do have it so wrong? Or yes, you have it so right. We are always excited and eager to hear from our listeners. Anthony, what are we coming to next? Next up, we have got 2003's Freddy vs. Jason. I, I am so excited for this one. I knew we were coming to it in our uh, since we were going to watch every film in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. But... That my I can't say my anticipation is just high sky high. I've never seen this one before. I'm so excited. It looks ridiculous. It is 100% ridiculous. And I hope you love it as much as I do. I hope I love it as much as I think I do as well in this rewatching. But you are like smiling so big. So I can't wait to have that conversation with you. To all of you, we want to thank you for listening to our nightmares. And have a spooktacular day. <laughs>